Hello everyone and welcome to the Public Interest Technology PIT Colloquium. My name is Roba Abbas and I'm a visiting professor at Arizona State University School for the Future of Innovation in Society and a senior lecturer in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Australia. Together with the director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective, Professor Katina Michael, we're bringing you another live session in series three of this unique seminar series. Katina and I would like to thank Melissa Waite and Anna Reid for all their support of this series. The Public Interest Technology Colloquium is an opportunity to hear from our global community about the social, regulatory, ethical, and other considerations relevant to the design, development, and delivery of technology in the public interest. The colloquium is underpinned by the PIT philosophy that is intended to draw people together from across disciplines and to address global challenges. PIT at its core requires shared meaning which is translational. It is to be inclusive rather than exclusive. It is also transdisciplinary while respecting the disciplines. Throughout the series, we'll be hearing from a range of speakers who will be sharing with us their experiences and their expertise. Our guests today are Ms. Toby Shorruff and Associate Professor Eric Fisher. We'll be hearing from each of our speakers shortly, followed by a Q&A session and an opportunity for reflection. For our live attendees, please feel free to note your questions in the chat window or indicate that you wish to speak and we'll ask you to unmute at the completion of both talks. Our first speaker today is Ms. Toby Shorruff. By way of introduction, Toby works to build the capacity of communities to understand make choices about, and ultimately shape the technologies that are woven into the fabric of our lives. Toby is a writer, trainer, project manager, and consultant, and also a graduate student in the Public Interest Technology Program at Arizona State University. Toby works at the intersection of technology and gender-based violence as a technology safety project manager at the Safety Net Project of the National Network to End Domestic Violence in the United States. Toby's talk today will focus on public interest technology principles with an emphasis on global perspectives through a review of Dubai's Expo 2020. As part of this technology forward global celebration, the Expo's program for people and planet promises that, and I quote here, together we will unlock the potential for individuals and communities to shape the future as we engage in conversations that matter and deliver real life solutions to real life challenges. With this as a backdrop, Toby will consider throughout today's session how visions from Expo 2020 reveal a range of global aspirations for socio-technical futures in dialogue with public interest technology principles. Thank you, Toby, and over to you. Thank you so much uh, for the warm welcome, and thank you to everyone who is joining today. Um, it is just such a pleasure to be with you. Um, to talk on this subject in the presence of those who have taught me. Um, I have to admit that I found it a little daunting uh, until I was reminded that I'm not trying to be any of you. I'm not trying to teach what you would teach, but rather to share my own journey and my own reflections on this um, by way of contributing to this community that we're building uh, of public interest technologists. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, thank you. And in addition to the, the biography that Reba was uh, so kind to read, I just want to say that I am joining you from the Tualatin River Valley, which is the land of the Atfalati people of the Kalapuya Nation, who are now part of the Grand Ronde Confederacy. And we're just outside of what is known now as Portland, Oregon. Um, and I use the, the pronoun she, her. And I work at the intersection of technology and gender-based violence, looking at the impacts of these technologies of our everyday life um, with uh, the systems that underpin them um, and to really look at how it is that we can make choices about those technologies, how it is that we sometimes come to feel ensnared in those technologies um, and how we can perhaps unravel those knots uh, and unweave a bit of what we have woven so that we can together make more intentional choices um, about weaving futures. With that, I will dive right in. Um, 
I'm really pleased to be sharing uh, this beautiful graphic developed together with Dr. Fisher um, and fellow student Jason Robinson um, a year ago as we went through a class titled The Principles of Public Interest Technology. Um, and this diagram uh, is really meant to evoke a loom. Um, something in which we weave. Uh, so beginning sort of at the top and, and working down towards the world that we want to create, beginning with um, principles drawn from responsible innovation. Um, beginning on the right-hand side of this diagram, we have the principle of anticipation. So recognizing that technology, uh, un unfortunately, often has unintended or unanticipated consequences. Uh, we can look at that in terms of the impacts of climate change coming from the energy technologies that were developed over the past two centuries. Um, we can also see it in, in terms of smaller things like um, web technology accelerating polarization when it was meant to bring us together. Uh, so these are just two examples of how we've we sort of failed to anticipate what the consequences of technology might be, um, but how with greater tools of anticipation, we can move towards uh, greater readiness, right? So that uh, we may not be able to map out all of the territory, um, to paraphrase Korzebski, but rather to say that we can, given what has happened in the past, have a better sense of what might happen in the future. And as we move through the other principles, bring some other voices uh, to bear and some introspection to bear as well. So along those lines, moving to the next principle of reflexivity. How can we look in the mirror? How can we see our own worldview more clearly, the biases and priorities that we might bring as technologists, as policymakers, um, to a practice of technology design and development? Um, how can we surface some of the things uh, which are really much more like the water that we're swimming in or the air that we're breathing and we don't necessarily take them uh, to be something other than they are. We don't realize the potential for them to be other than they are. Um, so how can we have that reflexivity, that looking in the mirror and not just let that stop at a process of introspection, but to become accountable for those priorities, for those biases and for um, bringing what we find when we do that reflection uh, into the work that we're doing in design and development of technology. And then um, a third principle, a principle of inclusion. Um, I think fairly famously or infamously, the tech industry has a diversity problem. Um, this is perhaps not true when you step back and look at the entirety of the tech industry. Um, when you look at the whole supply chain from the rare earth minerals and um, the factories where technologies are, are built and shaped uh, to the gig workers who are dropping off devices at our door, there's a lot of diversity. But when we ask questions about who is making decisions about the future of technology, who's making decisions about specific product, products and who is making decisions about the larger societal trajectory of technology, uh, we find that that is a much narrower range of people and that is work that is ongoing. Another aspect of inclusion is who has access to these benefits of technology, um, because certainly there are benefits and those are not evenly distributed. Um, to paraphrase William Gibson, we have tools at our disposal, but not everyone has those tools. We have connection, uh, but we don't, not everyone has connection. Um, so how do we shift that? And really with the goal of that being uh, a level of social robustness. Um, not only do we have robust products, but how can we make our society stronger and not just the technologies or um, not just the forces that drive those technologies. And across all of those, we have uh, this principle of responsiveness, um, this need to take responsibility, which has the same root, uh, root word as responsiveness um, to continually iterate, to continue to reflect, to continue to include, to continue to anticipate uh, in an iterative cycle uh, because technology development is not linear. Uh, technology dissemination is not linear, uh, but rather something that we spiral through as we continually improve. Um, so using these as a basis, um, I want to expand our focus out a little bit more and inquire into the foundations of these principles um, and perhaps also uh, the products and the directions that we're going in. So I've reproduced here um, a sentence which grabbed me in my 
first class in the public interest technology program and hasn't let go, um, though it, it went quiet for a little while and, and resurfaced uh, as I joined in some classes in uh, global technology and development here at the School for the Future of Innovation and Society. So I've, I've reproduced it here. Um, and it says that at least since the Enlightenment in the 17th century, particularly since the middle of the 20th century, and goes on to talk about how there's this informal social contract um, between inventors, between scientists, between, between technologists, uh, as we call them now, uh, and society. Um, and what stood out to me was this capitalized word enlightenment. And of course, by this, we mean the, the European enlightenment. Um, and I just wondered, um, you know, that's that's a great basis. It's certainly the basis of, uh, you know, American political structure, a lot of European political structures. Um, it hints at liberal values of uh, deliberation and inclusion and um, citizen participation. Um, but I wondered, is this something which would feel welcome and applicable in other contexts? Is that a foundation um, that everyone would feel uh, comfortable adopting? Um, and I, I began to wonder specifically if we could look to other contexts, uh, both historical and present, uh, as inspirations and as grounding points for public interest technology. So here on the slide, um, I've brought in some pictures and throughout these slides, almost all of the pictures will be ones that I took on um, a recent trip to Dubai to visit Expo 2020, which is uh, in the tradition of the World's Fairs. So um, up in the left-hand corner, we have um, some of the greats, uh, Ibn Majid and Ibn Battuta, uh, travelers and navigators of the Islamic world, the flowering of Islamic science. Um, we have a Chinese mirror, uh, which has been turned into a talisman, and that translation happened across the Silk Roads. Um, we have uh, Jandar Matar, the, the observatory, uh, the Mughal observatory in India, uh, astronomical observatory, and we have a rope bridge hand woven to return to our theme of weaving um, from Peru. And uh, that's from the, the Peru pavilion there at the Expo 2020. So each of these um, are just symbols to me of, of inquiring into traditions in which technology um, writ large, not just digital technology, but many of the technologies of our society, um, how these were intended to serve society, perhaps certain parts of society, perhaps all of society, uh, I love particularly the image of a bridge leading us from one place to another and handwoven, um, often handwoven together as a community. Um, so, uh, so I just kept this question in my mind of, of what other routes might we use for public interest technology? But not only looking to the past, then this question of how can PIT be applicable beyond the US and Europe? Is this something that we can export or transfer? Um, recognizing that there is uh, a legacy from the centuries of colonization of both extraction of resources from colonized countries, but also the um, export to those countries of ideas, of goods, of technologies, and particularly in the past century in our very benevolent approach to uh, economic development and now sustainable development. Um, this idea that uh, perhaps we can share ideas like responsible innovation. And so on this slide, um, you can see a quote from a paper which uh, I was led to, thanks to Dr. Fisher. Uh, I mentioned in conversation that I, I had this question that I was going to visit the expo in Dubai um, and that I was curious about um, what critiques from the global South particularly might be um, of bringing concepts, even of tech for good, even of tech for people and planet, um, from a northern context into the southern context. So in 2014, um, a group of early career researchers, 10 from Brazil, 11 from the UK, and three senior researchers gathered together in Sao Paulo, Brazil, to have a workshop addressing the question of how uh, responsible innovation might be framed in other parts of the world, particularly the global south, and whether the northern framings from Europe and North America might travel or translate beyond borders, and if they should. And so uh, what stemmed from this and what I was able to find, again, thanks to Dr. Fisher's help, was, you know, a 
good wealth of literature and, and to me a wealth of literature is, you know it dozen a dozen and a half articles which were really probing this question from a variety of different contexts um, all seeming to sort of agree yes we want tech to be better yes we want tech to benefit people yes we want more participation in technology um, but what can we do in terms of a dialogue across borders uh, to bring that concept so that we aren't repeating these mistakes of colonization, of technology transfer, of um, really overlaying a, a global North construct in other settings? Uh, and, and what I found through those articles, and you can see a number of those citations uh, on the slide, was um, really counter to the idea that um, that I think we often have if we're coming from wealthier nations from uh, the former or current colonial nations, um, that there's kind of a virgin land, you know, and it's it's for resources for the taking and uh, labor for the taking and uh, just barren of ideas and, and really that we should bestow those ideas um, on these places in the global south, but rather um, these articles said very strongly that there are many approaches, many grounded over the course of centuries, um, and many flourishing in the most recent decades, um, which speak to uh, shaping technology and shaping the relationship between society and technology. Um, I won't read them all out here, um, but I did highlight, particularly in this center, Arturo Escobar's concept of a pluriverse, or many worlds in one world, which he um, adopts from the Zapatista struggle in southern Mexico and Chiapas. So this idea that there, uh, there's not a lack of ideas and movements and paths forward uh, for social and technological development, um, and that we should approach on more equal, uh, equal footing, perhaps, uh, those pieces. So with all that in mind, I want to shift over to talk a little bit about this extraordinary space that I feel tremendously gifted to have been able to travel through um, over the new year. Um, the Dubai Expo, uh, which you see pictured here, um, was for sure had a theme park kind of a feeling to it. Um, it is, a uh, the word Instagrammable came up often, uh, right? So these are uh, most of the countries in the world projecting um, what they want others to see of them, both images of the future, but also images of the present, often um, idealized images of the past uh, and separated into districts, including opportunity. Um, which is the opportunity to fulfill the sustainable development goals specifically, sustainability, so um, as it sounds, and then mobility, which is sort of being able to have some movement in, in that. Um, so uh, we were able over the course of, I, I believe I had five days there total to visit hmm, maybe half of the pavilions. I mean, it's, it's a huge place. The world, thank goodness, is a huge place full of a lot of diversity. Um, but small pavilions, large pavilions. Um, and so I want to share a little bit of how I came to understand um, my experience there and the visions of the future that I saw. So um, as Robo was kind enough to read in the introduction, um, and I'll reproduce the quote here, there's this aspiration. Uh, but first of all, that the expo had a program for people and planet was like wonderful to me. You know, I'm like, I'm, I'm all about the people and the planet. I'm all about technology serving people. And planet. Um, and so to see those words brought um, as an intention for the expo was very exciting. Um, but, you know, having been around the block a few times in my life, I also wondered, well, how, did, how does that aspiration hold up in, in the reality of the expo? Um, so as I inquired into that. And as I tried to understand um, what I saw there, I grouped these visions of the future that were presented across the pavilions uh, that I visited into five categories. Um, and I'm going to, to walk through those now. So this first category, uh, the first two categories really will be very familiar narratives. So the first is innovating for repair. Uh, this was commonly the colonial or former colonial uh, nations um, often quite wealthy, um, situated 
in largely in Europe, in the global north. You can see here um, that there's a, a hallway as you enter, and this is from Luxembourg. Um, and all 17 of the sustainable development goals are here. They're on these 3D cubes coming out from the wall. Um, and as you enter further into the pavilion, you see examples of innovation and technology uh, that could be used to address the climate crisis, that could be used to address water, access issues um, and other things. So sort of this uh, really the heart of responsible innovation, right? This idea that if we have the know-how, if we have the expertise, if we have the, the wealth to do this, we should contribute to those solutions. Um, one aspect that was missing was often um, responsibility or, or culpability for uh, the actions that have led to the situations that we find ourselves in now. Um, so that was not something that was dwelt on particularly, but there was definitely this spirit of, um, you know, we're all in this together and we're going to do our part. On the other side of the coin from uh, countries that have been colonized. Um, we have an example here from Madagascar. So you see the repetition again of the 17 sustainable development goals. Um, and in the other picture, you can see um, people in Madagascar uh, mining for gold, um, sifting for gold there in the water. Um, but there's a very bold statement um, that you can see in turquoise letters there. It says that profiting carelessly on nature is a mentality that Madagascar doesn't want to be a part of anymore. So from this flip side of this familiar narrative, what I hear, heard was um, countries that continue to be subject to extraction and to uh, tourism, this call to say, we're, we're, we recognize that we're still in this power imbalance, but we are asking for better. We are asking for uh, more voice. We're asking for more care um, in the way that we continue that relationship into the future. So breaking from sort of those more familiar narratives, particularly for those of us um, in uh, the US, Europe, um, perhaps Australia, I'll let uh, those of you there uh, speak to whether that's a, a, a perspective that you have as well. Um, but there's uh, this idea of boldly visioning. So in this slide, you see examples from uh, the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and from the United Arab Emirates um, pavilions. So um, I said peninsula, but I meant pavilion. So on this reader board, and it was moving, there were a lot of sayings, and you can see front and center there, here we write the future. These were very bold statements um, from not just Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE, but they were really um, particular examples. Um, you can see um, some engineers working on mapping every street in the UAE. That's what the pickup truck is down there at the bottom. You see uh, another scientist who has been working on cloud seeding, which I have to say for me, seemed like futuristic Jetsons kind of technology, but we felt and were immersed in the actual results of for a good five days while we were there in Dubai, just a downpour of rain that was the result of cloud seeding um, to the point where there was an army of people with squeegees um, deployed in every public space that we went pushing that water off of the plazas and the sidewalks to go not much of anywhere because there's not a lot of drainage infrastructure. Um, and you see a, a simulation of a future space program. There is a commitment uh, by both countries to establish colonies on Mars uh, within the next hundred years or so. Um, and then this very DNA looking plant growing system uh, from the sustainability pavilion um, there as well. So this idea, like we're not asking anybody's permission, we're going to space, we're deploying these technologies, we are moving forward. Um, often with a, a, a narrative of how that will be beneficial to, to their societies and, and sometimes to the world. Moving a little deeper, there were certainly a set of pavilions, um, which I call reclaiming or just claiming. Um, oftentimes, um, this was a very central level of existence, right? We are, we are claiming our past, our heritage, uh, the greatness, of Angkor Wat in the case of Cambodia, or the Kingdom of Punt from Somalia, or the map of Mongolia here. Um, so just a sense that like we have existed and we continue to exist into the future. Um, and that, that was one of the places where I did find some critique of the extractive and colonial systems that we have uh, all the inheritors of. Uh, so in the Lesotho Pavilion, there was a beautiful video, which um, Rebecca, who's on the call, thanks for joining Rebecca, um, said, you have to go see this, Toby. And, and I, I went in there and I listened to it. And I wrote it down. I'll read this out. They're ravaging our precious earth, 
stealing what they can from our kingdom. Are stones worth it? Are we not in need of water flowing in our rivers? To err may be human, but at what stage do our errors become inhumane? It was a profound uh, and, and deeply moving um, message. And I think it was in a, a really important one that was tucked away in a, in a corner of the expo. Um, followed up by these images, this art from three pavilions on the right-hand side, beginning with Kosovo. Um, in the center, uh, a, a truck it, that is uh, the, the subtitle down there that you can't see says the hunter becomes the hunted. Um, it is made of bones and skulls to shape the sculpture of this truck. And then to the left here, um, a beautiful painting um, from the Morocco pavilion, um, which shows the the continent of Africa turned upside down to represent the upside down nature of its relation to the world where resources are extracted, but it does not have uh, a unified uh, voice amongst the many peoples of Africa to um, make choices about the boons of their continent. And at this point, uh, I began to sense an unraveling, right? An unraveling of this Instagrammable nature of the expo and unraveling of my own experience as I moved through pavilions, which bore relation to my own ancestral history, um, often with trauma, and moments where my breath was taken away in the intensity of the experience of noticing the dissonance between this very presentable and positive face with realities that I knew backed up those, those, those presentations. Um, this particular rug um, was from the Azerbaijan pavilion. Um, so I began to feel the sense that things were coming apart a little bit. And I, and I began to wonder if I myself am moving through the expo and finding these places that touch on my ancestral trauma, my personal trauma, and, and I'm finding that I don't know where to go with that. I mean, thank goodness I was with these incredible companions who, who we had joined and journeyed together um, to be able to process some of this. Um, but certainly most people who visit the expo might encounter a pavilion of a country from which their ancestors had been kicked out or they personally had been kicked out um, or whom they had had armed conflict with who were carrying um, uh, traumas with them, right? As they move through these spaces and where was the container to hold that? Where was the place to hear those stories? Um, and in talking with uh, my, my journeying companions, um, it came to me that really the experience of the expo is like a dream. It is like a dreamscape. You move into one space, it's beautiful. You move into another space and it breaks your heart. You move into another space and there's these beautiful smells or wonderful sounds. You're just moving and shifting from story to story and dream to dream um, and left to sort of weave those together as you process, um, as you walk through the space. Um, my friend Benjamin, who, who journeyed with said, and, and reflected this, and I, I asked his permission to share this because I feel um, that it really summed up so much of that experience, that there is no shared perception of the same thing, that everyone wakes up with a different foggy memory of their dream. But he asked, what if we're all dreaming the same thing? With that, I'll move into the, the fifth and final category of the visions that I saw there, which was this idea of co-creating, which I think will feel really resonant uh, to those of us interested in public interest technology. Uh, we have here images of these beautiful cones which were sustaining this delicate green life in the middle of the desert from the Singapore Pavilion um, and their motto, design with nature. Um, we have a, a, a girl holding a ball, a lit ball of string with a thread reaching out. And it says, a new Ariadne's thread connects our roots with tomorrow. Uh, referring to the myth of Ariadne giving a ball of string to Theseus as he makes his way through the labyrinth, right? An, an ancient symbol of technology which can confuse us and amaze us. Um, we have again the, the evocation of the DNA symbol here from the Philippines pavilion. Um, we have the, the forest of Sweden talking about being welcomed to the internet of senses. Um, and then in Arabic here, we have um, a, a saying from the New Zealand pavilion, which has uh, New Zealand has recognized legal personhood in, in a river. And so they say the river is our essence. When it is healed, we are healed. 
And I think these all offer clues as we move forward. Um, these images are from the Yemen pavilion. Yemen, of course, embroiled in a civil war and with great suffering um, for everyday people uh, right now. And yet this pavilion was inspiring and provoking questions about what the difference is between information and knowledge, how we bring knowledge to future generations. How do we maintain a bridge between ancient wisdom uh, and the future? And you can see in the bottom corner here, this amazing book, uh, the amazing book of al Wasabi, which depending on which direction you read it in, gives you knowledge of different subjects and it's all woven together. Um, so truly an extraordinary place. And these images from the Oman Pavilion um, showing the relationship between people and nature, um, in this case, frankincense specifically. Uh, so one very earth toned and one very technological um, in, in this reminder that we are a part of nature. Um, which was echoed throughout these pavilions that I'm sharing here. And then um, to move towards the close, uh, looking at these images of beautiful art from the Morocco pavilion, again, really, truly one of my favorites. Um, so to the left, we have what they call the template. And I, I zoomed up on a little piece of it here. It has words like rescue and solidarity, family, tools, honesty, global, and heritage. It was in English and in, in Arabic. And then built from this template is this 3D scaffold that you see on the other side. And these are maps for how we can move together uh, between people and technology, between humans and the more than human world, um, as we weave them together into a scaffold to build our futures on. So I want to close by just expressing so much gratitude to um, my guides, many of whom are here today, um, faculty uh, and teachers who have um, led me along this path so far in public interest technology and to whom I am deeply indebted. Um, all things which were inspiring from this are built from what they have taught me and any errors there are entirely my own. And then just also gratitude. Um, the first four here, my collaborators in Dubai and many others, uh, fellow students here at SFIS um, and, and collaborators on projects uh, beyond SFIS. So I'm deeply grateful to all of that. And I know that our, our Q&A will be later, but I ask you each to consider, um, what are we dreaming? And what are we weaving together? Thank you so much, Toby. That was such a fantastic and a thought provoking talk. As you mentioned, we will have the opportunity for reflection and discussion shortly. But first we'll hear from our second speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce Eric Fisher, an Associate Professor in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society and the Consortium for Science, Policy and Outcomes. He's the director, or excuse me, he's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Responsible Innovation, published by Taylor and Francis, and directs the International Laboratory Engagement Program on Socio-Technical Integration Research, or STIR, S-T-I-R, as well as the ASU Center for Responsible Innovation. Professor Fisher's work has appeared in science policy and science studies journals, such as research policy, science and public policy, science, technology, and human values, and nature, Professor Fisher has been a visiting professor at Delft Technical University, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, the Norwegian University of Technology, and the University of Twente in the Netherlands. Today, Professor Fisher will be presenting a talk on socio-technical integration research, in particular looking at the approach and its application by providing an overview of the design, implementation and effects of the approach as documented by numerous associated laboratory engagement studies. STIR explores how interdisciplinary collaboration between scientific experts and embedded humanists can support responsible innovation within research and innovation settings across university, industrial, governmental and non-governmental sectors. Professor Fisher will be sharing with us further information about the approach and the manner in which it takes into account public values and concerns as Professor Fisher will illustrate, STIR can have synergistic effects that enhance curiosity, care and creativity in research and innovation activities. The approach has been taken up in over 75 laboratories and research performing organisations across North America, Western Europe, Eastern Europe and Eastern Asia. Thank you, Professor Fisher, for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much, Roba. It's a pleasure to be here. 
I really appreciate the invitation and I really appreciate being able to present with my student and colleague and friend, Toby. I think she's uh, really one of the inspirations uh, for PIT scholarship and practice. Um, so my talk will be focused really on just one method, one approach called STIR and uh, giving a basic overview of it. Um, so we'll, we'll just spend a couple of slides looking at what STIR is, what distinguishes it, uh, some of its methodological components and how we classify and categorize the effects of doing STIR. And then I'll spend the majority of the talk looking at a few examples um, of uh, stirring laboratories and, and research organizations in academia, in industry, and in public-private partnerships. So um, STIR stands for Sociotechnical Integration Research, which is a little bit different from Sociotechnical Integration. Sociotechnical integration is, if you will, the goal. Uh, one of the things that we need to do if we're going to do good PIT, and STIR was developed to to look into capacities for various organizations, labs, teams to do sociotechnical integration. Uh, so it's really a research method, and it's uh, primarily qualitative. Although there are quasi-experimental aspects to it and it is done in a collaborative manner. And the primary goal for doing STIR is to uh, develop an understanding of the capacities to advance technology in the public interest. And we probe these capacities in order to understand them. Uh, and in the process of probing them, uh, we end up uh, more often than not enhancing, enhancing them and deepening them, which is, is gratifying. Uh, but what capacities, you may ask? Well, they're the ones Toby talked to us about, primarily inclusion, reflexivity, anticipation, and responsiveness. So um, as Robin mentioned, STIR has been uh, tested in various studies uh, uh, over 75 times across uh, four continents, multiple countries, uh, a variety of different types of R&D organization, um, private labs, public, uh, publicly funded labs, uh, university labs with different uh, R&D orientations. They could be working on basic science, applied science or commercial technology, and also uh, across a number of different types of, of R&D areas, everything from nanotechnology and biotechnology and synthetic biology to various forms of energy research, uh, financial technology and whatnot. And um, I've just reproduced a quote here from the National Science Foundation, uh, which identified STIR in uh, their 2013 budget request to Congress as a model for the future integration of ethicists and social scientists into nanotechnology R&D laboratories. And you can see STIR has been uh, funded by a variety of, of research funding organizations around the world. And it's also been, um, it's had some policy impact uh, as well. So in terms of the basic nuts and bolts of, of what STIR, uh, sort of the design, what it consists of, the approach, um, the STIR study uh, is, um, indicates that, that STIR is an activity that is conducted over time. So it's, it's very rarely used in a sort of one-off uh, workshop setting. It can be used that way, uh, but it's usually, um, I think it's much more effective if it's applied regularly over the course of approximately 10 weeks. And we've done all sorts of variations on whether we can do it in, in less than 10, 12 weeks and whatnot. And so it's interesting to compare those. But the main idea in the study is to compare change over time. And the three methodological components are uh, something we call the decision protocol, which is uh, based on a, a model of, of decisions. And, uh, um, and as you know, from Toby's presentation, responsible innovation is one of the precedents or cognate areas uh, along with PIT um, and STIR really was developed to probe the capacities uh, that scientists and technologists have for responsible innovation, which you can see a definition of here taking collective care for the future through stewardship of innovation in the present. And I want to highlight the concept of care 
um, in order to return back to it in a moment when we look at some of the stir effects. So what are the effects of doing stir? What happens when you do stir? What have we learned from over 75 studies? Uh, well, we observe three types of, of change in practice, which we call modulations, midstream modulations. Um, and these three refer to various forms of learning on the one hand, um, and also value deliberation. Uh, this is a sort of a next level of, of effect. And finally, practical adjustments where something is done differently. And you can see from learning that learning can be reflexive, which has to do with uh, oneself and the world, how one's thoughts influence one's actions, uh, influences one's world, and how one's world influences one th one's thoughts and actions. So one way to think about reflexivity is that it's reality bending back on itself. And so it's really neat when we can observe our scientific and engineering uh, counterparts and collaborators having reflexive moments. They also learn about the social context of their work and often learn about substance and content. In terms of value deliberation, this really just refers to uh, elucidating and clarifying values, any thinking that goes on around values. Uh, so prioritizing values or reprioritizing them, expanding the, the values that are on the table, uh, when, when you know that, that that they're working with in their projects, and occasionally critiquing the values that they're uh, essentially involved in implementing, and then finally, practical adjustments are are really important because these are material or behavioral or strategic changes, uh, changes in the way that equipment is designed and set up, or experiments are designed, changes in the way data is marshaled uh, to do new experiments, changes in behavior. Uh, talking to stakeholders that you might not otherwise talk to, uh, changing strategic directions or uh, clarifying strategic goals, et cetera. And these three types of modulation really rely upon uh, separate uh, virtues or dispositions, which uh, we've identified as curiosity, care, and creativity. Um, so one way to look at STIR is that it enhances curiosity, care, and creativity. But another way to look at it is that it really relies upon the curiosity, care, and creativity of our scientific and engineering counterparts. And it's important to note that all three of these modulations can really be done in two different orders. The first order modulations are really just um, modulations that are built around existing values in the existing system. Okay, so this might be a corporate system with corporate values, or it might be an academic system. Um, but these are, these are valuable modulations because they support and advance innovation. I was just talking about second order uh, and first order modulations. First order modulations are really built around things like um, saving time, saving materials, becoming more efficient, sort of the consultancy values that, that consultants are hired to, to save money. Um, whereas second order values and modulations are really, um, they're not just advancing innovation, they're, they're advancing responsible innovation. So they're taking public and, and social values into account, not just corporate or research values. So example number one, um, I mentioned that we, um, we have a variety of data streams and one of the ways we measure the effectiveness of, of STIR is to have a pre and a post uh, study questionnaire. So before we start a STIR study, we will ask a battery of questions. And then when we're done with the STIR study, we'll ask the same exact questions to the participants. And in this case, we were working with um, a group of five biotechnology project leaders in a, a firm. And we asked all of them, you know, do you think that integration is Sociotechnical integration is part of your job, or is it just something that you would do that's kind of extra because you're participating in the study? And at the beginning, only one of them said, it's part of my job. The other said, no, of course, it's something extra. And then we asked them the same questions at the end of the study, and all five of them said, no, actually, integration is part of my job. So this was an interesting shift in, in sort of self-perception. Um, here's a, a study that we did in a synthetic biology laboratory, and um, what, what was interesting about the study is that towards the end of the study, 
uh, the STIR analyst uh, fed back his observations. You know, this is what I found working with you guys for 12 weeks. I found that you have different concepts of safety. You have different safety practices. They don't always agree with one another. Um, and so there's sort of a diversity of safety approaches. And, and, and I'm not sure that they all harmonize. And when he, he presented them with this uh, set, set of observations, the laboratory began debating with itself and different people were saying, well, you know, we don't wear lab coats. You can see in the picture, nobody's wearing a lab laboratory coat. Um, and other people said, no, we don't need to wear lab co laboratory coats. Some people debated about gloves and, and various procedures. And this debate went on actually for um, about another week. And then it turned out that at the end of that week, they had stopped debating and they had come to sort of a silent consensus and everybody started wearing laboratory coats. No one before was wearing lab safety coats. <laughs> and I think this is important, not because it's important to wear lab safety coats, right? This is, this is still a debatable question. What's interesting here is that a group of scientists became interested in the fact that they disagree about what safety is. And in arguing about it, um, they didn't come to a formal agreement, they just came to a sort of tacit agreement. And so it's an example of self-organization. Uh, here's another example. Again, it's a university laboratory, and you can just see from, from the quotation, which I'll read, that reflections on responsible innovation using STIR generated novel ideas for antenna structures and nanoparticle synthesis. So this this shows the interesting interconnection between innovation and responsible innovation, between technology and public interest technology. They ask slightly different questions and they both need one another. And then um, uh, second to last example, this is a little bit involved because I'm trying to show that types of change over time, right? The, these modulations that we observe are very incremental and they happen from day to day, week to week. And unless the embedded humanist is really looking for them, it's easy to miss them. They'll just happen and nobody will really notice that they've happened because when you're doing science or technology, there's a lot of variables and there's a lot of change and uh, it's, it's, not, it's not normal to sort of to chart the change and ch chart every step of the way and every set of value deliberations that are involved. Um, so the, the first uh, time point here is when the embedded humanist uh, was talking to an engineer who's working uh, in a resident outside on a residence. And this is a private partner, a private public partnership. So it's an engineering team from a university who's working with a, an energy utility who's funding their work and they're developing a battery stack which is going to be designed as a demonstration to store energy for residential uh, energy systems. And the idea is if they got the battery stack built well and the resident liked it, then the utility was going to manufacture a number of them and roll them out um, in, in their state, in their jurisdiction. And the embedded humanists said, well, what, what are you working on uh, today? And they said, well, we're trying to figure out where to locate the battery stack. Uh, well, where do you think you're going to put it? Well, we'll probably put it on the side of the house. Well, why is that? Well, that's where the utility company wants it. Oh, okay. Well, what are you thinking about in, in coming to this decision? Well, we're thinking about what the utility company wants, but also we're thinking about what we think is best because we're actually on the ground here and we can see, we can make measurements that the utility cannot make. Um, oh, okay. That's great. Is there anything else you could think about? Well, we could consider the preferences of the homeowner. Oh, very interesting. Do you think you're going to do that? No, 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 no. Okay. Uh, so you're just going to put it on the side of the house? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Well, then um, in between the next stir exercises, uh, the engineers actually decided, contrary to what they said, to go talk to the homeowner. And not only did they decide to do it, they did it. <laughs> and they went and they spoke to the homeowner and they said, hey, we're, you know, we're going to put this on the side of the house. Uh, what do you think about that? And they ended up having an in-depth conversation. It was surprisingly insightful. And they changed the location of the battery stack. So it was no longer on the side of the house. It was now on the inside of the garage because that's where the homeowner wanted it. And that made more sense to the engineers. And even though the utility company didn't didn't want them to do that. They were able to do it anyway and convince the utility company, this is better for the homeowner and therefore it's better for everyone, including you. But just to give you a sense of how difficult it is to sort of bring about a modulation like that, um, when the, the uh, engineer was asked, are you gonna talk to the homeowner? He originally said, no. And the embedded humanist said, well, why not? 
And the engineer said, well, I feel like talking with the homeowner is out of our range because we are just electrical engineers and we're supposed to be producing wire diagrams and stuff. So you can see that um, in STIR, the embedded humanist wouldn't at this point jump in and say, I disagree, blah, 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 right? Instead, the embedded humanist just says, oh, that's very interesting, tell me more. And he writes it down or she writes it down and then comes back a few days later and says, well, what are you doing now? And how does that relate to what you said you were gonna do? So really it's a soft intervention. We don't try to bring about changes. We're just trying to see what the capacity is to make these reflexive and responsive changes. And the final example um, is we'll, we'll return to the private sector. This is also a biotechnology company. And we like to have uh, control groups as well as um, participants. And you can see that there are five innovation project leaders and five innovation project leader controls. So there's 10 project leaders. We did STIR with five of them and we didn't do five. We didn't do STIR with the other five. And you can see that at the end of the study, beginning, middle, and end, uh, we evaluated them based on key performance indicators. And we asked them, how are your projects going? And they all reported. And keep in mind, each of these project leaders have multiple projects that they're working on. Now, the ones that we did stir with on a weekly basis actually reported that their project quality was much higher in key societal uh, relevant categories, such as teamwork quality, technical quality, economic potential, and social relevance. Whereas the ones that didn't do STIR with us were all at or slightly below the baseline of what the company scores on their KIPs. So um, according to the, uh, the five participants, they, they thought that STIR was functional and useful and that integration measurably improved their R&D performance. So I like to end with this slide because it shows that STIR uh, can help advance responsible innovation, but can also help advance innovation. And that at the very least, this, this sort of suggests that contrary to what a lot of technologists and scientists think, asking these kinds of questions doesn't mess up the research and development. <laughs> Okay, uh, so in conclusion, stir effects do enhance reflexivity and responsiveness. This demonstrates that scientists and engineers in the studies that we've, we've, we've conducted at least, do have a capacity for midstream modulation, which is a type of governance from within. Uh, so they don't just um, uh, have to think about scientific and technical um, uh, aspects, they can also think about societal aspects, and this won't hurt their innovation. As a matter of fact, this will support responsible innovation and in public interest technology. But it's also important to remember that STIR is only one component. Um, so to actually bring about systemic change on a wide scale, uh, that's going to require a multi-level approach and an institutional approach. And so that so STIR can play a role there, but it's certainly not the only the only thing that we should be using. So thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Professor Fisher. That was such an uh, enlightening talk. And uh, there are many questions I certainly have. I'll just quickly uh, open the floor for any audience member discussions. Thank you also to Toby. I think as you were both delivering your wonderful talks, there are so many points that warrant for further exploration. Eric, while we're still on the topic of that uh, multi-level perspective that you left off on, uh, you said that STIR is one component, there are other components. Do you care to share with us what some of those components, are, perhaps one or two that come to mind in that multi-level perspective? Absolutely, Robert, it's a great question. and. I think one of the important uh, components would be public engagement, because really STIR is involved in what I call expert engagement. And so it's important to open up expert spaces and expert capacities, um, but that can only go so far. It's, it's also important to interact with, with a wide variety of stakeholders. And this doesn't necessarily happen um, in the laboratory, right? This might happen in the public library. Um, or, or in a political forum, but the idea of conducting them simultaneously and then having the streams interact with one another is very important. I would also add that, that we need to engage policymakers, um, not just in terms of what they call for in their proposals, how they design their, their research programs, um, but also how they fund them and who they listen to. And when they're evaluating those programs, 
uh, that they shouldn't just simply evaluate them based either on economic return, on patents filed, or on papers published. But they should also look into public values, um, and they should look into these reflexive capacities. Um, so I think it's very important to have a soft intervention where we don't ask scientists and engineers, prove to us that you're a good person, uh, right? But we say, well, did you consider a wider variety of stakeholder views? And how did you consider them? And what, if anything, did you do about it? And I think those are good enough questions if they take them in earnest. Um, so that's a little bit of, of, a, of an answer to your question. That's a great answer. I think that the idea of public engagement, the multi-stakeholder perspective is, is key to, I guess, operationalizing any of the PIT principles that uh, Toby mentioned and that you alluded to, Eric. Um, in addition to that, I think that approach would allow you to, in a addition to professional expertise, incorporate, as you said, some of that um, uh, opinions of, of the public, of society, of policymakers, of a range of stakeholder groups. And, and I think as part of that and embedded within that idea is this notion of lived experience. I might just on that point backtrack to what I thought both Toby and yourself might wish to comment on this, were four really key points across both of your presentations. Um, the first point was around decision-making. Um, so how we actually enhance, in the case of Stir, uh, Eric, decision-making processes by asking the right questions. Toby, you alluded to the idea of who has the power to make decisions and who's provided with a particular choice. So that was one point that I thought was, uh, was really important. Another was accountability through a process of design that emerged and, um, and struck me as something that I'd be keen to hear about. Um, Toby, you mentioned translation beyond specific borders, beyond the United States, across different domains. And, and finally, with what Eric was just mentioning about soft interventions, your deliberative processes and engagement between certainly the embedded humanist and engineers, but also beyond that. Um, uh, in society. So in terms of both your presentations, I think perhaps what this might require is some kind of shift in narrative where decisions in relation to design, in relation, Toby, to translation are not driven by industry uh, and technologists. Uh, rather that transition, we shift that perspective to a more stakeholder inclusive perspective. In terms of practical steps, in light of those four points, or perhaps you can pick one of those points, what do you see as the practical steps in perhaps shifting that narrative based on your experience, Toby, of the expo? And then Eric, if you'd like to comment on that um, based on the socio-technical integration research that you've been a part of on the ground. So to sort of to recap, we need a shift in narrative uh, to ensure we don't have um, uh, the powerful making decisions to incorporate more deliberative processes. So how do we go about doing that? I may jump in first because I have a, a small inspiration um, in, in response to your wonderful questions. Um, and, and they always are wonderful questions. I, I deeply appreciate being in dialogue with you. Um, this question of, of who is involved, right? I, I, I want to say very clearly that being able to travel to Dubai, uh, being able to go to the expo there is a privileged position. It isn't something that is just open to anyone. Uh, it's also really important to recognize the labor um, often underpaid labor and dangerous labor <clears throat> that went into the building of the expo site and its maintenance. Um, and so there are power dynamics and inequalities that are inherent in this sort of theme park fantasy land that we got to move through. That said, uh, I think there is always, uh, you know, as maybe you saw from my previous answers, I think there's many ways of seeing something and those are in, in tension and in dialogue with each other. Um, there's also something tremendously powerful that really shifted my own thinking about the future, about technology, from being able to experience on a multi-sensory level visions of the future and to be able to interact with them. It's almost like moving through a lab space of smells and touch and sound um, and interconnection with other people, um, which makes the future or these visions of the future more concrete. And I think uh, enriches our ability to consider what it is that we want to build. I come from work, um, which is to end gender-based violence, right? And so it's fighting against something. Um, and I find myself called and a lot of what brought me to this learning community was how do we build things together and not just take things down? It's important to take things down and it's important to be critical. It's important to examine the past 
Um, absolutely. And also it's important to articulate and make beautiful these visions of the future because I think that we understand from um, climate science that motivating people to shift behavior, motivating people to shift their societies doesn't happen just from hearing about the doom that is coming and that is already here, but comes from our yearning for the beautiful in the future and for ourselves and for those who come after us to occupy that. And so I think that um, there is a deep value and I wish that it was a, a more open and accessible value of being able to encounter each other in these spaces where we're dialoguing about the future and about visions. Um, and I think that this relates, if I can draw a connection to the stir work, right? This isn't just reading a paper or thinking about the theory of how you might possibly change your process, but having those dynamic and unpredictable interactions between the humanist, the embedded humanist, um, and, and the scientists and the technologists who are doing that work, that there is something that we can't predict that happens there, um, and that happens on a very subtle level that's important. We've got a question from Associate Professor Joseph Carvalco in the chat window. So, uh, Toby, um, I'm told that new technologies is is advancing exponentially, but that our understanding of technology is advancing along a straight line. We don't understand any one kind of technology either as to how it works or what its potential to affect us physically, psychologically, or spiritually. So if we foster or advocate for public interest technology, what will or can it do to reduce the difference between what is occurring with regards to technology acceleration and our understanding of what it means to our future or to our lives? in the future? What a great question, Joe. Thank you for putting that in the chat. Toby, any thoughts on that? Um, thank you so much, Professor Kravalko, for coming today. Um, I have been inspired by your talks on this colloquium in previous years, um, and they've certainly shaped my own thinking about public interest technology. And I think that your question is essential um, because there are there's sort of a surface level in which we can seek to understand technology and its effects and its interplay with society. Um, but I think there are much deeper ways that technology affects us. Um, I, I think it's commonly said in our field that technology is not neutral, um, but it is not just the obvious effects um, that, that I think uh, those are important, but there is something that is more deeply changing who we are as humans are changing the way that we understand our world and the way that we understand ourselves um, in ways that I think beg a much deeper investigation, um, a spiritual investigation, a mystical investigation. Um, and I think that these effects in some ways uh, are, are challenging to see using even some of the more robust tools that we have um, because understanding ourselves on that level has been challenging throughout human history, even when our technologies were less complex. Um, I agree with you very much that um, technology is accelerating exponentially. In fact, I think that's one of the central conditions that we're operating under, in addition to uncertainty and complexity and interconnectedness, um, that that level of acceleration is concerning. And a, a sense that I hear um, amongst those who are perhaps more optimistic about technology and less cautious, that technology development is inevitable that we're inevitably moving towards the singularity, that we are inevitably moving towards a world in which there is less of the more than human world and far more of the human affected world. Um, it has been my own experience going out into wild spaces that those wild spaces are not untouched by the changes that we have wrought, whether that is um, nuclear technology or air, uh, air travel or the effects of, of climate change. Um, and all of that shifts how we dream. You know, during this pandemic, I've dreamed that I'm wearing a mask, right? During, I dream that sometimes I have a phone and I can't make it dial, right? That these things are affecting us on some of the deepest levels of what we would call our humanness. Um, and, and, and so I, I wonder at those changes. And I think that our capacity to dream and to talk about our dreams, um, just as one aspect may be a doorway into this, that we don't just need the tools of hard science, but we also need the tools of the humanities, the tools of um, our, our faith and our curiosity uh, to truly explore that and that we need to be in dialogue with each other to better understand those effects. I hope that goes some way towards answering your question and I, I welcome your, your response and, and your feedback. 
No, I think that's a, a wonderful perspective, and I think you've, you've probably got it got it right. Um, one of the things I'm fascinated, and thank you, by the way, for your comment uh, earlier, but I, um, I'm kind of fascinated by the idea that, um, you know, we live not just as in the generation we're in, but some of, most, all of us have touched the earlier generation. We, we know our, our parents, we know our grandparents, sometimes we know our great grandparents. And, and I often wonder, you know, what is the difference spiritually and psychologically in many ways between let's say my grandfather, whom I, who I knew, he was born in about 1885. I was born in 1942. So my, my father-in-law was born in 1900. So I knew those people, as you know, people that were born in maybe the 20s or the 30s or the 40s. Um, and you have, and you compare, you know, what was their perspective? You know, how did they feel about the kind of technology that began to infuse or, or permeate their lives, like the airplane or the radio or television or the computer. And I can go on and we all know what I'm, I'm driving at here. But I do think it would be interesting to, 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 to talk to these people, to, to get their appreciation of how it was they think their lives may have changed because technology essentially came into their lives. And I wonder if it really changes any. I wonder if I'm really different from my grandfather or my father. Uh, you know, in, 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 the, in the fact that I'm living in an age of Facebook or I'm living in an age of artificial intelligence. Am I really different? So, you know, I keep wringing my hands over the fact that, gee, what's artificial intelligence going to do to us as we approach, you know, singularity, which I doubt's about. But uh, the fact is that, am I really different? Anyway, just to think that- I wonder, um, I wonder that also, and I think sometimes we have this perspective when we think about people from the far past, thousands of years ago, that somehow they were yeah. different in consciousness than yeah. we are. And to some extent that's problematic, right? Because when I read through, I'm Jewish, and when I look in my tradition, when I look in the Talmud, and I see the kinds of questions and interrogations and investigations and dialogues that they were having, they were right. as deeply curious and had the same kind of intellectual tools that we have to unpack the world around them in great detail. Um, so I think that we can't assume like that there's so much difference. Um, and on the other hand, I think that uh, we are shaped by the world that we move through. So um, Eric, I don't know how you would add to that. Those are wonderful reflections. Um, if I if I may add, if I can jump in, I'm not sure if people can hear me or not. We can, yes, please go ahead, Eric. Okay, great. No, I'm really struck uh, by by Toby's responses, um, and I would, uh, and also picking up on what um, Lakshay put into the chat about his accountability. Um, I guess I'm and, and transparency. I think that is a vital uh, value, but you'll notice that we didn't include it in the PIT principles. And there's a reason for that. And that is that there've been several studies of um, corporations and firms who really say, look, we, we, just can't, we just can't afford to be transparent. So then, you know, that, that presents a dilemma. Well, do we say, nevertheless, you must be transparent, otherwise we're gonna stop buying your products? Or do we say, okay, um, you live in a capitalist, you compete in a market economy and uh, intellectual property is important. So can you still engage in PIT? Can you still engage in responsible innovation? And I think the answer is yes. So basically, if we're gonna shift the narrative to who decides what research to conduct, what, you know, what science to develop, what technology to apply, what innovations to disseminate, um, so that, that who decides these things are not simply uh, concentrated decision makers at the top, but that it's more widely distributed and widely shared. I think it's really, really important to look at context and how, where the decisions are being made 
uh, can really change. So if we're working in a you know university laboratory versus a research funding council versus a startup versus a multinational corporation, there are going to be different governance architectures. And so in some of those cases, I think we can insist on transparency. In others, I think we probably can't. Um, but in both cases, in both cases, one of the things that I, I would say uh, both Toby and I are pointing to um, is the, the importance of a broader sensitivity to not just how innovation goes right and how we want it to go right, but how it can go wrong and how it has gone wrong. And to somehow be able to demonstrate, I guess this is, um, this is something I feel pretty, pretty strongly about that we have to demonstrate to people who are skeptical that it is possible to do this stuff, right? Because a lot of people would say, oh, PAT is really a great idea. And you know, if I have time on my lunch break, I'll listen in, but I'm really not gonna change what I'm doing. I'm not gonna invest my money differently. I'm not gonna develop technology differently. Well, why not? Well, because then I'll fall behind, I'll get distracted. And this is a widespread assumption that if you stop to reflect on values, then you won't be able to complete your, your equations or, or do your tests or do your marketing. And I think STIR and other approaches show that that's just not the case. So I think we need more demonstrations that it is possible to do PIT and to be successful. And th these stories need to circulate uh, among our allies, people who from the inside of the technology world can say, yes, this is possible. We agree with this. And then we really need best practices. We need tools and approaches that we can implement and arrangements. And they need to be tested, whether, whether it's meant for an industrial or an academic setting or a, a policy setting. I think we need to be able to show that, yes, they do work in these areas. So, uh, so this is kind of a call for more um, action-oriented research. Uh, because we have to do research to see what works and what doesn't. And if it does work, we have to disseminate that. Um, but we don't simply want to, uh, to, to have it be trapped in the disciplinary world. So as Katina always says, you know, we, we respect the disciplines, but we're not beholden to them. If, if I may add Go ahead. to that, I think that one of the crucial and, and very interesting trends right now is the degree to which um, industry and technology companies have begun to bring in social science researchers, to bring in privacy professionals, to bring in people from civil society and government, government to do this work of internal governance. Um, and I think that in some ways this is um, a compromised path forward uh, in terms of this transparency piece, right? I mean, certainly um, as those of us in the public, we may desire to know more about the inner workings, but, but it is a, a capitalist and competitive environment in which um, companies have some need to, to keep some things uh, inside and, and to not be transparent about them. And so the question that comes to me from an organizational perspective and that I think tools like STIR um, and other tools that I've, I've learned um, from Dr. Fisher and from uh, all of the faculty here are, are really these questions of how do we work in an interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary way. If, if companies are folding within themselves greater diversity and folding within themselves, um, not just a representational diversity of identity, but also a, a diversity of approaches and, and ways of thinking and being in the world, there will be tensions, right? I think that that um, has famously come out in, uh, or infamously again, come out in some news stories about um, researchers who have gone into large companies and had to leave large companies. Um, because of, I think, some of that uh, difference in, in ways of approaching the world and approaching the work and figuring out how to work together and communicate together um, and, and larger issues besides that. But I think that it's important um, to, to uh, provide tools uh, for internal use within companies um, to be able to address issues around privacy, to address issues around um, harms and accelerationism, to be able to weave in these factors into the work that they're doing. Um, and as Eric's saying, in, in ways that will, um, <laughs> that maybe will even improve the bottom line and, and not just that they may have worries that it's gonna harm the bottom line, but that there can be these um, unanticipated positive consequences <laughs> that come serendipitously uh, from the, the use of these tools. 
fabulous reflection, Toby, and also Eric. There are so many points we can expand on and reflect on and discuss. Something that I think um, certainly within the context of responsible innovation and what you both highlighted, I think we can really direct our discussion here to probably two aspects. One is around the idea of values that you both suggested um, and that you both spoke about. One thing is about the business value and the social value and how we align those and certainly stir as an approach is one way in which we can demonstrate that alignment in addition to others that you suggested, uh, Eric, in terms of that multi-value perspective. Uh, now, I'm interested in each of your thoughts as to whether you can shed some light about alignment strategies, particularly where there's a particular uh, a particular conflict or perhaps uh, an incompatibility between a business vision and social values. And uh, Toby, part of your reflection about Dubai uh, Expo 2020 was that you walk through and there is this conflict, this inner conflict within you, certainly with the technological stuff, the shiny uh, gadgetry the potential for the future with what you're feeling in terms of trauma and so on and to me that's an incompatibility so there's two parts to this it's that conflict in values that we somehow need to address to work towards alignment when we're thinking about certainly operationalizing principles and then there's also this notion of harmonization between the social and the technical realms that feed into that values-based view and that alignment of values. Do you have any thoughts, either of you or anyone in the audience, certainly, about alignment of potentially conflicting values and how we seek harmonisation as a sort of second point to that, uh, uh, to that question? If I can just jump in briefly, Robot, Please. and respond. I think it's a, such a wonderful question. Um, I think that... Broadly speaking, there are two basic approaches to resolving value conflicts. One is a more technocratic approach and the other is a more political, uh, ideally democratic approach. And I think they both have uh, um, you know, things to offer. They're, they're both, both valuable. It depends on timing, it depends on circumstance, it depends on what's at stake, what's possible. Um, but a technocratic approach to value conflict might um, might look like some of the, you know, the amazing pre-sustainability environmental work that that was, you know, has been going on in in the '80s and the early '90s. Um, things like the natural step and um, the uh, cradle to cradle approaches, where um, you know, and, and companies like Patagonia have have championed these, where they they do multi criteria analysis and they come to resolutions and they look at what the shared values are and they. They jettison what, what isn't something that's shared and they just really work on advancing base values. Um, um, but, but you know, this, is, this, is, this relies on a lot of social science and experts and sometimes the social scientists are not available or their methods are misused or they themselves are not as reflexive as you know, we would wish them to be. Um, and, and so that kind of swings the pendulum to the, to the more political and democratic approach where uh, there really need to be, um, whether they're consumers or citizens or, or um, you know, civil society groups or activists who speak out and identify problems and marshal public awareness. And this is an ongoing struggle. struggle. You know, I, I just flew in from the airport today and there were two uh, places where you could eat food. One was a very healthy, organic, locally sourced uh, and locally run business and nobody was at the counter. And then there was, you know, a, a big national conglomerate that, that, you know, sells food that's arguably less healthy and it's cheaper and everybody was lined up to buy that food. So, you know, uh, you know our public is just continually uh, fed what I think is not about something, you know, you know, as erudite as a, you know, a technological program can be very costly and expensive. And so, you know, um, but it's nevertheless valuable. So those are, I think, the two, the, the two approaches that have to move hand in hand. Thank you for your insights, Eric. Toby, do you have any additional thoughts on that? Um, I think I think that what Eric has said is uh, both very tangible and very uh, practical um, in, in terms of how to approach these issues. And um, so I think that what I would try to add to that um, 
is to bring some of um, my my own experience from my from my work and and from my my understanding um, on a more experiential level um, that the process and, and this perhaps ties back to Joe Car Carvalco's question earlier too um, the degree to which we're able to to know ourselves and to know ourselves in in dialogue and in storytelling with each other. Um, my uh, dear friend Rebecca's on this call as well, and, and her interest is in dignified storytelling, that often the stories that we're telling of each other um, and about each other um, are not rooted in what is actually in front of us, but are rooted perhaps in what we hope or what we fear. Um, and that there is a value in simply encountering each other. Uh, I think that this came up a little bit behind the little glimpses that we got behind the scenes in the expo as I spoke to um, people at two pavilions of, of countries which have been very recently in armed conflict with each other and the way that they spoke of each other and yet they were in dialogue and in sharing space with each other in a way that wouldn't have been possible had that uh, gathering not taken place, right? So there's, there's something to... Um, being in a curated space, a, a facilitated space um, in which those conversations can happen. And I don't mean to make this sound like sort of uh, loosey-goosey and, and, and not practical, but um, I think it, it does get to sort of those serendipitous pieces that we can't always predict what's going to happen, but simply being willing to engage and to listen uh, and to speak honestly from the heart, which are not always uh, skills that we bring into the technology world or into the business world, right? Um, but that the, the degree to which we're able to perhaps as uh, pit practitioners or as humanists or as social scientists to create an environment, um, even if it's a festival environment in which people are able to have those unlikely uh, encounters, um, that that is perhaps a path forward for us um, because we need mutual esteem and we need that space to reflect on ourselves and our own values in, in ways that we might not naturally um, do. And, and so I think that that's crucial to look at the base values. And, and I'm very curious about um, the degree to which base values uh, from the policy sciences framework are, are translatable um, across contexts as, as well. Um, sometimes what we assume to be universal, I'm, I'm learning in my current class, um, an idea like freedom is maybe not as universal as we imagine it to be, or at least the way that we're articulating a notion of freedom, for example. Um, so, so that we need to co-create that. Um, I, 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 to tie this back into Pitt, I guess more directly, in the process of co-design, we aren't just talking about co-designing and you know, um, prototyping, we're talking about co-defining the problems that we're even facing. It really gets back to just what is the problem that we want to solve here and then how can we work together on it rather than assuming that that decision or that frame has already been set. Toby, I think that was a wonderful reflection. I could talk to you for hours about co-creation and co-designing and co-defining, certainly. Something that I think is really important to all of that in terms of the deliberations, the discussions, the engagement, I think is trust and a, and a theme that we haven't necessarily delved too deeply into. I know, Eric, you talk about that in your work and it's linked to responsible innovation and certainly, I guess, a requirement for the uh, effectiveness of the STIR approach. Do you have any thoughts about trust as it links to responsible innovation? Uh, so trust has many facets to it. A trust can be perceived from the perspective of organisations. It could be perceived from the perspective of the end user or consumers. What are your thoughts on uh, perhaps Eric and then Toby, if you have some final reflections about uh, the centrality of trust to this process, to responsible innovation, to the operationalization of public interest technology processes or principles, and to socio-technical design in general? Great question, Roba. Um, my thoughts are sort of on different levels, again, um, depending on the context. Um, in terms of, of the STIR studies, um, I would say that STIR was really designed for uh, environments where there was a lack of trust of social scientists, um, which is pretty much 90% of, <laughs> um, you know, science and engineering uh, laboratory work and, and R&D work from, from my experience, and for good reason. Uh, because social scientists don't always understand innovation, ethicists don't always understand technology, um, they may not care about what the values and experiences are of the designers. 
Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's kind of paternalistic to say, well, you guys should be more responsible when we're not taking the, making the effort to understand what are the degrees of freedom within which they can be responsible? What are the trade-offs? Um, so, so we start with this idea that there really isn't very much trust. Um, and we, we establish these ground rules. And, you know, the STIR approach is one way to establish those ground rules where we don't ask anything of them other than, you know, just listen to our questions and respond if you will. And you can keep working while we ask you the questions. You don't have to prepare for our meetings. They're not interviews and you don't have to stop working. STIR is really designed to go into the workplace and allow them to keep doing their job and they can just reflect as they're, as they're working. And we'll even help them do their job so that we don't break any test tubes or slow them down. Um, so we really go to a great length and then we sort of measure what happens that slowly they will, the scientists and engineers will come to trust the philosophers and the social scientists, but it's only because they see that they're making the effort that the social scientists are making the effort to understand what their life experience and work experience really is like and to understand the, the science and the technology and that they themselves are doing good work. And so all of a sudden, you know, uh, in good anthropological fashion, you have to prove yourself as credible and then you're trustworthy. Um, but this is very different in uh, a, a corporate environment or in a public environment. And then when it comes to building trust among citizens, right? I think citizens have to trust that their voice matters. And there's so many reasons that they have that their voice doesn't matter. Um, and, you know, that, that, that's kind of, you know, a lasting concern. That's, that's a perennial concern in democracies. And it's always a vulnerable and a fragile thing, but to somehow build trust in institutions um, and to have those institutions be trustworthy, right? That's, that's having a conversation up at a, a different level that we probably don't even have time to get into. I would just quickly add to that, um, that I'm really inspired by the work of Tuesday Ryan Hart and Tim Mary, um, who helped to guide conversations in difficult spaces, and to really focus the idea that um, how, how groups get unstuck and how groups build trust is by engaging in shared work together, right? So not this idea that we have to trust before we can do the work, but that the process of struggle, the process of the work, the process of engaging together with some degree of grace and recognition of power differences, but not waiting until all of those are resolved to move forward, but instead finding that space of co-design, that space um, where we have um, a shared work and a shared product uh, project to engage in a shared uh, problem to define and to move forward on. Um, just getting into that work will help to build the trust itself. Um, Thank you so much, Toby. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Fisher. Uh, with that, I think we're out of time in terms of questions. There are so many points I'd love to discuss further with you both offline. I'm sure the audience um, are probably thinking the same. So I'd really welcome that opportunity. I really appreciate um, uh, Eric you sharing with us information about uh, about STIR, about the approach as one way you mentioned now to remedy trust and, and to do a lot more and operationalize some of those principles. And, and Toby, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your experience about Dubai Expo and a lot more. Uh, thank you to the audience, to uh, Professor Katina Michael, to Melissa Waite, Anna Reed, and uh, for anyone interested in referring to this talk and reviewing this talk, it will be up on the SFIS, the School for the Future of Innovation in Society YouTube channel shortly. Thank you once again to our wonderful speakers for your time, for sharing your insights and, and a good day to you all. Thank you.